Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. We're pre-recording today because we had some early morning appointments to attend to. We have come in our chapter-by-chapter chapter study of the Bible to Micah chapter 4. We finally find uh, some hope and some elevated promise in Micah, as Micah, like Amos, is spoken so declaratively against the transgressions of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and uh, after depicting this dark ruin of Judah and Samaria at the end of chapter 3, he describes them as becoming a plowed field, that the city of Jerusalem will go from being a glorious city and Samaria go from being the city of the northern kings to just being a plowed field where livestock will be put out to pasture and crops will be grown. It's very discouraging, but then we come to chapter 4 and see the extension of a far-reaching vision of a coming Messiah and the establishment of the rule of God, not just over a limited jurisdiction, but over all the earth, age without end. And the magnitude of the positivity of chapter 4 reflects for us how the people would have received what Micah has said up to this point. Because he's just not depicting uh, a difficult time. He's depicting the utter, absolute uh, uh, abolition, annihilation of the people of God, of, of whom there is no other alternative purpose that God is working through any other people. So it has ramifications not just for them, but for all of humanity at the point that it was given. And so let's read Micah chapter 4, 113 and see this stark contrast of going from, as Joel said, and I've repeated it so many times, going from a day of darkness, great darkness and gloom, to now morning spread on the mountains. Micah chapter 4. But in the last days... It shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all people shall flow into it. And many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth out of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off. Listen to this. They will beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they will sit every man under his vine, who is the vine, and every man under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. For all the people will walk every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and forever. In that day, verse 6, says the Lord, I will assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast off a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign, over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come 
even the first dominion. And we're going to talk about what that is. What is the first dominion? The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Verse 9. Now, why do you cry out aloud? Uh, is there no king in you? Is your counselor perished? For pangs have taken you as a woman in travail. Verse 10. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now you will go forth out of the city, and you will dwell in the field, and you will go even, yes, to Babylon, and there, from there you shall be delivered. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Verse 11. Now also many nations are gathered against you that say, Let her be defiled. Let her eye look upon Zion, upon the destruction of Zion. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they he his counsel, for he will gather them as sheaves into the floor. So verse 13, Arise and thresh, and he's talking about intercession, Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thy horn, or thy power, iron, and I will make your hoofs brass, and you will beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain. Now this is talking about the transfer of the wealth. I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance under the Lord of the whole earth. So Micah 3, the previous chapter, concludes with this prophecy depicting total ruin of both the northern and southern kingdoms. The picture at the close of the previous chapter could not be more bleak. In order again to understand it properly, we have to consider the fact that up to this point, God's dealings were exclusively with the Israelites at this time in human history. Uh, his dealings with the children of Abraham constituted his entire active involvement with mankind up to this point. There was no alternative plan or other purpose revealed other than hints at various passages in the prophets regarding messianic hope in the end times. And then we turn to chapter 4, where we have this stark contrast from utter darkness and despair in chapter 3 to this brilliant hope and expectation in chapter 4, not only for the people of God under the old covenant economy, but for all the peoples of the earth. The chapter tells us that here that the mountain or the prominence of the house of the Lord, the government of God, will be established above all the earth and all people, not just the Jewish people that all the peoples of the earth will flow into the mountain or the preeminence of the government of God. And it, this is a foreshadowing of the door of salvation being opened, not just to the seed of Abraham, but to all the nations of the earth that will say, as Micah declares, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his path. Now, what are the ways of God? Uh, it's more than a legal code. It's more than the law of Moses or some moral ethical standard. Why? Because the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Second Corinthians 3, 6 declares, God's way and truth are expressed not in a lengthy scroll, but in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as Jesus said in John fourteen six, he said, I am the way. This is the way that Mike is declaring God's going to teach us how to walk in that way, how to be in Christ and allow Christ to be in us. He's Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Uh, it is not our moral excellence that brings us close to God. It is not a religious code or culture that brings us close to God, but it is our personal, visceral experience of the Lord Jesus Christ whereby we experience, we taste and see the forensic reality that He is in us and we are in Him and the trajectory of our life is dominated by the living Christ uh, within 
You know, we and he's saying this is going to come that all the people, all the people, all means all, are going to walk in the way of the Lord. Now, when we look at the darkness and the gross darkness all around us, we wonder if godlessness is going to continue to dominate the world scene, uh, leading to some apocalyptic end. But make no mistake, just as Daniel promised and Amos predicted, the promise of God is sure there's going to come a day that the nations of the earth will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks when the mechanisms of destruction and the war machines of the earth will be turned to the benefit of mankind and not her destruction. And you and I are going to be alive and walking around on the earth to see it. We might be on the other side of a glorified body, but we're going to be there as a part of the retinue of the king implementing his rule upon the earth. Verse 4 says that at that time every man will sit under his vine tree and under his fig tree. Now, Jesus said in John 15, 1, he said, I am the vine. The fig tree is representative of, of Israel, restored and established as the preeminent nation over all the nations of the earth, not as a Christ-rejecting people that they are right now, but as a people ruled over by the resurrected and returning Messiah who will implement his unbending rule from Jerusalem over mankind for a thousand years, with all the saints serving as his administrators and his ambassadors. Verse 5 says, during that time, everyone's going to walk in the name of his God. And what is that name? It's the name of Jesus. This is not just something for another time. It's not just something we're looking forward to, although it is in eternity future, but in a measure, just as the kingdom will ultimately physically come, it's also coming in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's coming in us daily. We partake. You know, ruling and reigning in a measure begins now. We reign in life, as Romans chapter 5 declares. We reign now in life by Christ Jesus. We partake, you as a born-again believer, you partake in a measure of the millennial grace of God to the degree that your lives are yielded to the rule of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The intimate input by which the sweet influences of the Holy Spirit alter the trajectory of your thoughts and your actions as you go through every day as an ambassador for Christ. So the kingdom has come, it is coming, and it will ultimately and fully come in its eschatological fulfillment at the close of the age of man and the beginning of eternity future. Now, the promise is that God will assemble those that are halt or those that can't walk. How many people do you know that would tell you, I just can't walk this walk? They're having trouble living for God. It's more than they can do. They're not, they're not standing up and being bold in their faith because they say, well, I just can't walk it. Well, there's going to come a day that those that are halt and those that have been driven out and those that have been afflicted uh, will be raised up as his remnant. He, even those who have been captive and dispersed through the nation, speaking of the natural Jews, uh, it's, uh, will be restored, not of a godless Jewry, Jewish nation, but a nation of the descendants of Abraham who will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So there's a dual application. It speaks to us of the broader purposes of God and also about natural Israel. is It's not either or, it's both. And he says in verse 8 that the first dominion will be reestablished. That's very powerful. This speaks of the dominion that God gave Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis 1.26. You see, the consequences of the fall will be completely reversed and its effects obliterated. You should read Romans chapter 5 to get more insight on that. Because of these great promises, what's our part? The prophet calls on the people in verse 9. He says, cry aloud. He said, is there no king in thee? <laughs> in other words, Jesus is in, the blood, is in their bloodline. It's not just talking about an earthly king, 
but of the Messiah who was present in the bloodline of the line of the kings of David, even at the dark time that Micah is prophesying against that very lineage because of their disobedience, the call of the prophet Micah is to travail. That's our part, to travail like a woman, a church, which the church is a woman, giving birth. Because even though in Micah's day, the nation was in captivity to Babylon, well, Babylon is alive and well today as well. And you could read in Revelations about that that we're travailing to be brought out of the captivity to the cultural Babylon that's all around is just as natural Israel and the nation of Judah was brought back after 70 years of captivity out of Babylon. Verse 11 states further that even though the nations of the earth consistently range themselves and set themselves against the nation of God, he says they don't have his mind. And they cannot overthrow his determinate will to raise up his people and to bring forth from their lineage the king who shall rule not just over a natural kingdom of Judah, but over all the earth, whose gain will be the substance, the earth, the gain of the earth, he says in the very last verse, will be the substance of the Lord and his consecrated servant. That speaks in verse 13 about the wealth of the earth laid up for the just and transferred to kingdom purpose for the enrichment of the people of God and the furtherance of the gospel in behalf of the suffering and the impoverished. Now, what is this saying to us? What is to be our response? Our response is to obey the command of verse 9 and 10, to cry aloud and make it a purpose in our hearts to intercede and pray as Jesus taught us to pray. I, I could really see this chapter as being an inspiration for when Jesus said, pray like this, thy kingdom come. He said, is there no king in thee? We're to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, both in our lives now and including in the scope of our prayers, the subjugation of all the earth to the sovereignty of a soon coming king. He has come, he is coming, and he will come. And we're travailing into that purpose as the church of God, travailing like a woman giving birth. Because the purposes of God come forth out of us by the travail, just like Abraham had to give his son first before God would give his son. Likewise, we must travail, giving ourselves over to travail to the birthing of the kingdom. And as we give ourselves over unto him, he gives himself over unto us into the ultimacy of the manifestation of the rule of God. <coughs> Pardon me, on the earth. So, Father, we thank you that the mountain of the Lord's house is filling all the earth and all peoples are flowing into it. Not just a pitiful ragtag few believers who are hanging on while the Antichrist plows the earth under. I thank you, Father, that your purposes, you're making our horn, our power as iron in the earth. And that, Lord, the gain of the peoples of the earth, the nations of the earth, is set aside for those that are walking in the kingdom, that are part of your retinue, that are part of your administration. And we want to administrate and adjudicate for you. And we want to travail in prayer, to birth, to make it a consistent part of our prayer on a regular basis, to intercede for the birthing of the fulfillment of all that you've promised. In Jesus' name. Amen.